be door shut at 11 o'clock. Be in your seat. Okay? Alright, let's move. <laughs>
and then they're going to take a brushing from my lungs, you'll see it on the video, it's like a little brush that'll rub the lungs. Um, they'll also take a biopsy sample, so little pincers, we'll take a couple of little samples from my airways and I'll do what's called a lavage, or they'll flush water in and out and take a sample of that to see what kind of cells come away. So there you go, I will see you on the other side. Thank you. 
and synopsis. Now the next section is a little bit more brutal and it's the biopsy section. So he puts down um, a little set of pins, you can see them open there, and he tries to grab hold of part of the uh, bronchial tissue. You can see he's going to grab now, attaches on. I don't think he actually managed to grab that first section. So he'll try again, open the pincers up, take it down, take a nice big vice and pull. And this is the chunk that he took out. So you can see the massive chunk out of the wall there. So we had about 10 of these, so he keeps going around, finding sections, grab hold of tissue and pull. You can see that's a bit like a video game there, all the blood splattering. And this didn't actually hurt because the tissue that he's grabbing has no actual nerve endings or nervous tissue there to actually create, to, to feel any sensation. So I didn't actually feel any pain during these samples, which is quite amazing really. And the last one, take a bite and pull. There you go. And this is the actual procedure from outside. So this is the nurse passing Dr. Hicks the actual pincer, which is on the end of a wire. And the nurse behind Dr. Tim Hicks actually had the control mechanism to open and close the pincers. So she's closed the pincers and Dr. Hicks is just getting in the right position. And you'll see him just tug on the wire that was placed down in a minute. And that was the actual mechanism to actually get the set sample. So there you go. He tugged it then and he took the sample. And this is the actual end of the procedure where Dr. Hinks is actually pulling the camera out on her. So you can see how long the camera is. He's very gently manoeuvring it round, not to do any damage through my throat. And pull it all the way out, and through my nose, and there you go. And then immediately after, I spot some oxygen through a nasal tube, so I put it around my nose, and this is what I have to say about it all. Swallow, but 
can actually still breathe, which is a good thing. Um, but other than that, the actual procedure, I didn't feel any of the brushing, I didn't feel any of the lavage. The only thing I felt was some of the tugging when they were taking my biopsy samples. So all in all, a good job, and I think I'll do it again, definitely. Um, so there you go. When they come back from the procedure, bloody sputum is to be expected, a little bit of bloody sputum, but we don't want them to have massive amounts of bloody sputum, okay? Because they, they could rupture something and bleed out. So a little bit, like some blood streaks in the mucus would be expected, but just frank red blood and large amounts would not be, would be a, an indicator that we need to call the physician a problem. So what about bronchospasms? Yes. So what's so dangerous about bronchospasms? Closes the airway. Closes the airway. So any of these patients who have lung disease can have bronchospasms, okay? Any of them can have bronchospasms. Especially dangerous, really dangerous, in bronchitis and asthma. In bronchitis and asthma. So oxygen therapy is where we're going. We breathe 21% oxygen every day. We all breathe 21%. Did y'all know that? There's other components in here besides just pure oxygen. 
and we breathe 21 percent so oxygen therapy is not a cure it's not a cure it's a supportive measure it's a support measure for the patient to give them support until we can get them back to normal health right some patients never get to that point so they have continuous oxygen right mm -hmm. okay. so we talk about abgs pulse oximetry um oxygen administration systems all right, the only two things that are on your syllabus right now that you need to focus on are the nasal cannula and the face mask. So that's all we're going over in class. The nasal cannula, there's tons of stuff in your book, all different things, you know, <laughs> breathers, on and on. The only two things that you need to focus on, again, nasal cannula, face mask. Okay, we'll talk about some of the other ones in three and four. So, this here is just a breakdown. If the FiO2 is going to be the percentage of oxygen that the patient's getting. And then you're going to have leader. So we as nurses usually see the leader part, right? Mm -hmm. We see the leader. So do you need to know this conversion? No. No, you don't need to know this conversion. But if the physician writes for 32, 33% or 32% um, FiO2, you may get need the respiratory therapist to interpret you. Interpret that. What is how many liters is that? Now, usually the respiratory therapist is going to put the oxygen on them, but if you're in a situation you have to do it, you know, and they write FiO2 order, you can ask, simply ask. But that's what that is when you see FiO2. And it's just a percentage they're getting of oxygen today, okay? So versus the liters. So your nasal cannula goes from two to four or two to six liters. Nasal cannula goes two to six liters. Anything higher than four liters needs humidification. Needs humidification. Why? It dries it out. Dries the nose out. So I've got a patient on two liters of oxygen. They're having nosebleeds and they're dry. Can I put humidification on two? Yeah. You could. With they're an order, dry. I could. Yeah. With an order, we could. We could, but the general rule is four, four must have it. Four and up must have it. Okay, because it's definitely, it's high flow, it's going to, you know, dry off their nose, specifically. All right, so now, I have, I have humidification on a patient who will say has four liters of oxygen on. I have humidification, I've got this water bottle over here. And I've got this line that comes off this water bottle, this bubble, and the oxygen's going through it, right, bubbling, getting some moisture. So I've got this water bottle here. I've got this line that comes off um, and connects to the patient's oxygen. It's like a Y line or a Y. Anyway, condensation builds up in that tube, in that humidification tube, right? Mm -hmm. So what do we do with that condensation? Mm -hmm. Yes, bacteria can start growing in that, right? Because it's warm, it's wet moist mm -hmm. bacteria can grow so what do we do with that condensation do we hold the tube up and run it back into the bottle of water no Change the tube. get a new tube usually most of those lines have like a bag that catches the condensation and it has like a little opening that you can drain it out but if it doesn't if you don't have that set up which you're probably not going to see this but if it doesn't have that set up then you would disconnect it, run the condensation off, and reconnect it. You never, ever, 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 can't stress it enough, put that condensation liquid or allow it to go back into the humidification bottle so because of bacteria. You disconnect, let it run out, and then reconnect? Yes. Yes. How often do you need to do that? As often as there's, I mean, if there's a lot of water gathering up in there, you don't want water to, you know, like impede the oxygen flow. So you want to do it pretty frequently if it's gathered up there. Okay. So it's, there's no set time as to when to do it, except if you're looking at the tube and it's got a lot of water in it, just go ahead and do that. But this day and time, like I said, most of the time they're going to have a little um, catch bag, the bag that catches the condensation of the fluid, and you can just open the plug and empty it into a container and then discard it. Okay? But if we don't have that, we're going to just open it up, drain the, the liquid out, right, reconnect. All right, so humidification also is used for long-term oxygen use as well, because that stuff will dry the nose out. So one to six liters, I said two, one to six liters for your nasal cannula, 
and S23 to 44 FiO2, which you need to concentrate is on the liters. Um, for your mask, it's 6 to 8 liters. For your mask, it's 6 to 8 liters. So the, the nasal cannula is lightweight, right? Mm -hmm. And I can eat with it. If I was a patient with it, I could eat, right? I can talk. But with that mask, I can't eat and talk, I'd have to remove my oxygen source for those two things, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you will see a patient that has a mask on, but has a nasal cannula at the bedside. So they'll switch them from the mask to the nasal cannula while they're eating. Okay, just for their meals and then switch them back. So you may see that. All right, so what are the nursing interventions for applying and monitoring oxygen therapy? So. As a nurse, now we've kind of talked about a little bit about the two different things and you know what they're about. Um, but as a nurse taking care of a patient that has oxygen therapy, what are some of the things that we are going to have to do for that patient, or we need to do for that patient? Monitor safety. their O2. Monitor their O2 site. Um, watch for uh, too much oxygen. Make sure, no Make sure no one's smoking. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. Yes, that could be next. Make sure they can't trip over the wires, right? That it's free so that if they go to the bathroom, they're ambulating to the bathroom, then it's not a trip hazard. Mm -hmm. What else? Monitor for signs of too much oxygen. Monitor for oxygen toxicity. You're going to see that when you have like an FIO of 50% or greater. So that you're talking about a high flow device, mm -hmm. um, you'll see that. So we're not really going to get into that, but just know that there is so such no? thing as oxygen toxicity. Oxygen is a medication. It's a drug. Okay, so. It's a drug. So we always start with the very lowest and work up. We want them on the lowest, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, it is a drug. All right, so what else with this patient? Make sure they're those are irritated. Looking they're for ears. irritation. They're very good. I'm glad you got that. If they have the nasal cannula, we're looking behind their ears, right, for breakdown. Mm -hmm. If they have the mask, we want to look around their face for breakdown yeah. or around their head where the band goes for the mask. Yeah. Um, make sure that there's no breakdown. Anything else we need to look for? Well, do we know when we walk in that room that if we know the patient's getting an order for two liters, do we know that the that the, that it's set on two liters the device in the room? Mm -hmm. Guys, that's one of the one of the things that you need to look at. When you walk in the room, I'm looking at my patient first. Patients always first. Are they breathing? What do they look like? They look like they're in distress, right? Do my assessment for the patient. If it's a focus assessment, not only am I looking at the pulse ox, a focus assessment for an oxygen patient also should include what? Auscultation, right? The lungs. Are you short of breath? Do you get short of breath when you walk to the bathroom? Yeah, they might need to be called breath. Mm -hmm. Do you get short of breath? Right, ask them to call for help if they do. Do you get short of breath when you're eating? So remember that <coughs> the, the, the breathing is work for the body. Breathing is work. Okay? So anytime that a patient is doing anything in, additional, in addition to that, such as walking, eating, even simply combing their hair, washing their face, anything like that, it's speaking. Speaking. Um, they're going to get more short of breath. If they're already short of breath. Right? Because then we think about the metabolic demand on the body. Breathing is a metabolic process. Right? So if they do any of those, they're going to get short of breath. So when <coughs> we'll come back to that patient in just a minute. We're going to talk more about that. But if we're gauging a patient's shortness of breath, we're trying to assess how their shortness of breath. We need to ask them those questions. We need to observe them walking to the bathroom. So I'm not going to send my CNA in there. I'm not going to delegate my CNA to go assist that patient to the bathroom. If I have a patient short of breath and I'm really not sure how short of breath they are, I need to gauge that. Right? I'm going to go walk them to the bathroom. I'm going to go in there to assist them to the bathroom to see if they're short of breath when they get to the commode, or is it when they get back in the bed, or is it not at all? Okay, so COPD patients who have had the disease for a long time, they're short of breath when they walk to the bathroom, when they get to the bathroom. So bedside commodes is some, something that we use for them. They're also short of breath when they eat, and we're going to talk more about diet and how to work with that. And they get short of breath just simply talking to you. 
They may say three words and start gasping for breath, okay? Three word sentences and gasp for some breath. It's pretty short a breath. Okay? So make sure that you're gauging their dyspnea. You're assessing what it is. And documenting appropriately. How can we document something if we don't know? Patient states they're having shortness of breath. That's great and all, but isn't it better if we see it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is this a patient in the bathroom? You know, um, patient became short of breath. Gasping for air before reaching, you know, commode. Well, maybe we need to see about getting them a bedside commode, right? Okay. So back to that patient. So we, we said how to nasal cannula. I'm walking in the room. I told you we look at the patient first. Patient's always first. Equipment's second. Patient's always, always first. Can't stress that. Patient's always first. So looking at my patient, doing my assessment, and then before I leave that room, part of my assessment, guys, part of your assessment is to look at all the equipment in the room. What if they have somebody else's antibiotic hanging? What if they have somebody else's fluids hanging? What if their oxygen was supposed to be on two liters, but the family come in and decided that at home they get four liters and mom is having shortness of breath, so we're turning it up to four liters. You have to look at these things. You have to pay attention to not only the patient, but the what's in the room, what's hanging. Even if they're not connected to this IV up here that's hanging, I want to know what's hanging. What, what, what did my patient get? I always look at what they've gotten. It kind of gives you a, what? The whole picture. Okay? So we talked about the skin. We talked about the wall, the mantra on the wall. We talked about auscultating the lungs. We talked about the OG site. If there's any ABGs ordered, I'm going to go back and look that up, or look it on the computer and see what the results were. Okay? I want to know those as well. I want to know what their H&H &H is. Could that be the reason they're short breath? Could that play into this scenario? This is why they're needing oxygen. Well, if you've got a patient that has a hemoglobin of 7 or less, most likely they're going to be displaying some types of shortness of breath. Okay, maybe with activity, it probably isn't at rest. At rest is the most, is the worst shortness of breath. If they're at rest and they're still having shortness of breath when they're sitting in their bed doing nothing, then that's pretty severe. Mm -hmm. That's pretty severe. Okay, so what should the nurse include in home oxygen teaching? Well, we talked about the smoking part. Mm -hmm. Someone brought up smoking. That is huge, guys, not only at home, but also in the hospital. We want to make sure the patient knows they shouldn't smoke and the family members can't smoke either. So at home, I've done home health for a lot. Of, I did home health for many years. Patients, we'd have patients sitting up there with oxygen on, COPD, just to smoke them. So when I walk in the house, if they're smoking, if you don't put that out, I'm leaving and you can call me and I, if, I can come, if I can fit it in my schedule, I'll come back to see you. I'm not staying in this house while you're smoking. Okay? Because mm -hmm. it's not only the patient's safety, but it's your safety. If they choose to smoke, um, if they absolutely have to smoke, take the oxygen off. Turn it off. Take it off. And some can't tolerate that. Mm -hmm. So they cannot smoke. They need a sign on their door. Oxygen in use, no smoking. So people don't walk in with a cigarette in their hand. They need to let their family members know as well. They need to make sure they have backup tanks. They may have a, what's called a concentrator. It's this big box looking thing. And it takes the air and it changes it and pulls it out and, make, and basically takes the oxygen out of the air and puts it through the tubing. It's called a concentrator. It concentrates. It does what it says. Um, this is plugged up to power. So if the power goes off, the patient has no oxygen, so they've got to, we've got to make sure they have backup tanks. If they need to go to the doctor, they can't take the concentrator with them, so they're going to need to be put on a tank for that as well. Okay? So we need to make sure that not only do they have tanks, but they have oxygen in them. They have oxygen in them. If not, we need to call, or are instructed to call, usually I call when I'm in the home, um, the DME company, that's the equipment company, whoever supplied the oxygen, and I asked them to come out and switch out tanks, give them some full tanks. 
Alright? So we want to teach them to look at their skin. Everything that we do, we want to make sure. Tell them do not turn the oxygen up. Do not, do not turn it up. Leave it on the set prescribed amount. If they're having shortness of breath, they need to call. If they have home health, they can call the home health provider. If not, they need to call their health care provider. If, if the shortness of breath gets worse or increases. This patient, these patients with all these disease processes, guys, every single one, anybody with a lung disease are more susceptible to infection. Why is that? All the mucus and stuff. Yeah, the mucus doesn't leave them as much. They've got all this mucus here. The cilia in their nose and in their throat, the cilia that moves the trash out is not working properly. It's, you know, they're disengaged. Um, they have fluid possibly setting in their lungs more than normal. So they're more susceptible. A lot of them are on steroids. Steroids makes them high risk for infection. It decreases their immune system, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of these people are on steroids. Okay, so there is a picture of some patients who got burned. This happens. I've been witness to this. This happens. Terrible. They get burned all the way down with their soft This is terrible. Okay. So safety considerations, um, the smoking. Flow rate, flow adjustments, we talked about that. Do not change them, maintain equipment. Um, this equipment, there's a filter, there's a concentrator, there's a picture of it. And you can see the bottle on the front where they can put um, water in for humidification. Um, there's a filter in the back of this machine. Usually the DME company comes out and changes that out or maintains that and cleans it. Um, so you make sure that that's being, usually they'll put like a date on the back of it, make sure that's being done, that that filter is getting um, cleaned. If it's not, it sets the patient up for infection. Right. All right. So identification or malfunction. Um, if they have a problem, they have backup tanks. Right. You go to your backup tank. Call the DNE or Home Health. Um, ordering supplies and oxygen. We talked about that. They just need to make sure they have backup tanks. Signs and symptoms to report if they get short of breath. Right. If they have mucus that starts looking yellow or what green or bloody, that changes from what it, what the baseline is. If they run a fever, what's a, a normal fever is going to be, it's not considered a fever until they're 100.6, right? Mm -hmm. So 100.1 is not considered a temp. Do I want to know about it? Yes. But a temp, but we're not going to treat anything until it gets to 100.6. Did y'all know that? 100.6 is considered a fever. So I thought I was talking about 1.5. What is considered a low grade fever? I'd be concerned because I would think it was going to go higher. I would not not be concerned, but I'd watch it closely. But until it gets to 100.6, most physicians don't even want to be notified. Depends on what's going on with the patient, their disease process. Now, if they're neutropenic, different story. And do you know what that is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it means their immune system's already down really low. They have no white blood cells to fight infection. Yeah. So if they're neutropenic, yeah, that's different. But it depends on the, the patient, but 100.6 is usually the mark for that. All right, let's see. Diet and activity and travel. They need tanks, right, to go to the physician. Um, activity is tolerated. Diet, whatever the physician is wrote for. We're going to talk more about diet in these patients. Electrical outlets, um, important that they have one. A lot of times that concentrator is really, it puts up a lot of heat. So that you may want to have the, the tubing long enough that they can sit in another room. Um, is it going to decrease the amount of oxygen? Yeah, it could decrease the amount of oxygen the longer the tube it is. But if it gets too hot in that room, they can just move the concentrator to another room and have the tubing long enough. They can sit in the living room and have it maybe in the little side room or something or in the kitchen. All right, so does everybody know what an AMBU bag is? I know you've had CPR, but a lot of um, students get to three and four because we start talking a lot about AMBU bags and oxygenation there and don't really know what an ambu bag is. Do you know we can put oxygen yep. through it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know that it's got a face mask. You see it? <coughs> so if you've got a patient, we'll talk more about this in four, but if you've got a patient, you take the face mask off if you've got somebody that intubated. See this mask right here, the one without the face mask? And it would go straight to their tube, whether it's a trach or an ET tube. Okay? So it's got a reservoir there. Um, it's got tubing and your face mask. So that is your ambu bag. 
just want to make sure everybody knows what that is. Your incentive spirometer, also known, you might hear it called an IS. Okay, you may hear it called an IS. So what is the, what is the purpose of an IS? Increase lung capacity. Increase, com, increase lung capacity well, by Spreading the air, the lungs of the like open up the alveoli, right? Remember, we that patient that has COPD. We're we'll gonna talk more about that in a minute. The COPD patient, what happens is air gets trapped in their lungs, and they collapse. Those little alveoli collapse, and when you have a patient has atelectasis, um, uh, another word to put in your dictionary, atelectasis. That is collapse of your alveoli. When a patient has that, and they'll have that after surgery. You'll see it a lot of times after surgery. Mm -hmm. But just think about, we put, we bring a patient into the hospital, and what do we do? We put them in a bed. Mm -hmm. Most of the time we tell them, because they're getting pain medicine or some type of sedatives, don't get up. And like, Call me if you need to get up. So decreased activity can lead to increased secretions, can lead to less airflow into the lungs, right? And we can get atelectasis, collapse of the alveoli. And when they collapse and there's no oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange anymore, nothing. So we lose that surface area so there's less oxygen in the blood, less oxygen the body can use. Okay, so this IS helps open up and keep those alveoli open and help prevent atelectasis. Okay, so you want to make sure the patient's sitting up, teach and encourage use for sure. Use realistic goals for the patient. So use realistic goals, guys. Um, usually the respiratory therapist will come and let, give us kind of an idea of what the goal is for the patient. But you don't want the, the this patient with COPD and this patient over here that ha is in because they have a fractured leg are going to have two different goals. Because the COPD patient is not going to have the volume that this patient over here with a fractured leg, a young person, let's say, or even old, that doesn't have COPD or any lung damage, it's going to be two different volumes. So it's going to be two different goals. So know what's going on with your patient, set realistic goals for sure. If you're sure not, if you're not sure what to set, um, get with your respiratory therapist. This is where interdisciplinary care comes in, right? If we have a question about respiratory, call them respiratory therapists or ask respiratory therapists. Oh, guys, I'm losing you and it's good lunch time. All right. All right, so percussion and vibration. This is your chest physiological, uh, so chest physiotherapy. Chest physiotherapy is what it's called. It's where they are basically moving secretions around, relocating secretions. Okay, and usually you'll see this done. Physical therapists, I have seen physical therapists do, but usually respiratory therapist does this. All right, so to enhance gas exchange, monitor O2 saturations, ABGs, indicators of hypoxia, right? Any indicators? We have to say hypoxia because we're not always going to have ABGs, right? Mm -hmm. We're not always going to have, most of the time we don't have ABGs unless we're in the unit. We're in the critical care unit. Or in the ER, we might get some ABGs. But if we're on the floor, most of the time we're not going to have ABGs. So we say hypoxia because we're going to do the outer signs, right? Not the blood. So what are some of those? We said O2 sat, cyanosis. Mm -hmm. What is one of the first things you might see? What is it? Not usually the first thing. That's more later on, but it's something we're looking for. What is some of the first things? What is something you might notice about the patient? Trying to breathe. Restlessness, absolutely. Restless. Anxiety, restlessness, they're squirming in the bed. They're telling you, sometimes they'll tell you, I don't know, something's wrong, but I don't know what it is. Something's wrong. You may see that before they actually start getting short of breath. I have witnessed the patient have a PE before, right before my eyes, and that was one of the first things that they said to me. I don't know, something's wrong with me, and I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't probably five minutes later, probably less than five minutes later, they were short, extremely short of breath, turning blue, and coating. Okay, so if a patient tells you something, take it to heart. You know, investigate it, figure it out, find out what's going on with them. If you think something's not right with your patient, it probably isn't. It probably isn't. Have another nurse look. Come look at the patient. Okay. I oscillate lung sounds frequently every two hours. If you've got a patient who has respiratory issues, 
we're going to listen every two hours. Write that down, star it, every two hours. Even if they come in the hospital for something else. <coughs> they come into the hospital and we'll say they have cellulitis of their right foot, but they have a history of COPD. They're on oxygen, they're getting steroids, they're getting bronchodilators, but that's not why they're here. It's not an exacerbation of their COPD. They're here because they have cellulitis and we're treating them without the antibiotics, right? <coughs> you still need to assess this patient every two hours. They're, they're breathing. You still need to assess them every two hours. Listen to them every two hours. Okay. So monitor fluid balance is important to do because especially if they've got mucolytics on board. Remember we talked about that lots of mucus, mucolytic drugs. Then without fluid, we're not going to get that secretions up. Um, if they're CHF, sometimes they'll have heart issues, and we're going to talk more about that. Use a collaborative approach. Use a collaborative, we said that, interdisciplinary, collaborative, same thing. Use all of your entities, social worker, dietitian, respiratory therapist, right, nurse practitioner may be involved, physician, all of them are interdisciplinary. They're treating this patient. We're all going to talk to each other. We have to talk to each other. We're not in this by ourselves. It's a team effort. Okay. Okay, promoting effective airway clearance. So, enhancing gas exchange is similar to promoting airway, right? Effective airway clearance. So, except when we say um, when we say airway clearance, we're talking about getting mucus up, foreign bodies, those kind of things that might be there. Okay. We're talking about that. Um, also, with the asthma patient, that clearance might be that we need to give them some steroids, right? Or a bronchodilator. Ensure adequate fluid intake, humidification, medications. Um, we're going to go more in depth over the medications, okay? These are some of the ones we're going to look at. Many nebulizers. How many of you have done a nebulizer? A few of you may have. So, as nurses, we usually don't have to do that. But there have been times that the respiratory therapist has gotten in a tight. Um, had maybe some patients in the ER, or a patient on another floor, coding or crashing. Nobody was available. And my patient needs, they're having shortness of breath, they need their bronchodilator, their breathing treatment. They're, they're, um, uh, they need their medicine, albuterol. That's the word I was looking for. Albuterol. They need their albuterol now. But I've never done that before. It's important that you know how to give a nebulizer treatment. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to read my book mm -hmm. under nebulizer treatments. But when I'm at the hospital and clinicals and I see the respiratory therapist and they're going to give my patient a nebulizer treatment, I'm going in with them because I want to know how to do that. And I'm going to say, I really want to know how to do that. Will you show me in detail how to do that? Show me what you do. Okay. So, if there's something you want to know, ask, <coughs> ask, ask. If you're not sure about something, ask. You're, it's so wonderful that you're in a learning environment right now. It's great because now is the time to ask all the questions you want to ask. And just take in everything you can take in. Because when you're a new nurse on the floor and they say, here's your four patients to take care of. Do I have a lot of time to learn? And I have more patients, maybe five, maybe six. I'm going to still have to learn, but then we're not going to have a month less time. So just learn everything. Just soak it all in. Everything that you can take in now, ask questions. If you see something going on in the hospital, you see some physicians going down and they have a tray or something in their hand, talk to them. See where they're going. They may be going to do a thoracentesis at the bedside. They do it at the bedside. Okay. So make sure you read over your nebulizer treatments. Lower airway alterations, atelectasis, we went over that already, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Everybody understand what that is? Mm -hmm. I don't think we need to go over it again. Make sure you put that in your um, your words, you know, definition, and look through that in your book, okay? All right, so we're to pneumonia. I'm going to let y'all guys go ahead, go to lunch, because you're supposed to get a break, too. Go ahead and go to lunch. Be back in your seats. Be back in your seat at 1 o'clock.
to be back in your station. Somebody tells you to be back in a certain half-bath instructor, it means in your station. 